Hi, welcome to the Global Day of Jewish Learning's 24 by 24. I'm Karen Sponder, Project Director of the Global Day of Jewish Learning, and I'm thrilled to be here today with Deborah Katz, who has worked with me as the curriculum editor for this year's and last year's Global Day of Jewish Learning curriculum. It's really been truly a treat working with her. Um, in addition to working with me, she's the founder and editor of Holocrums.com. She's written extensively also for the Lookstein Center, Baba Ganoos, Camp Mosheba, and various schools around the country. She overall works to bridge the gap between formal and informal education and spends her time both in and out of the classroom, virtual and real, creating curricula that seek to educate and inspire. So without further ado, uh, Devorah Katz will teach about creation and creativity a unit from this year's curriculum, which was actually also authored by Devorah. Thank you, Devorah. Good morning, everyone, or good evening, depending on where you're um, coming from this morning. For me, it's morning. I'm sitting in my house in Israel. Uh, Karen, thank you for the lovely introduction. My name is Devorah Katz. Uh, this is my second year working with Karen as the curricular editor for the Global Day. Uh, part of the joy of being the editor is that while we're working on every piece, there are ideas that resonate throughout. And this year, when we decided we would be talking about uh, the idea of creation or creativity, um, over time, this, this piece sort of started to seep into my head. And I always like, you know, I, I love um, Tanakh, I love the, uh, the Bible, and so I always seek back always to say for a very sheet to sort of look at what the beginning was, right? I'm looking at a paradigm. I'm looking at where things started from. Um, this idea of creativity really resonates wonderfully within me. And I think even today, sitting here at something as creative and dynamic and as technologically savvy as 24 by 24 is, um, we're really uh, encompassing the ideology behind what it is that the Steinzeltz Foundation, that Aleph Institute, is doing. Now, today, not only are people um, getting online to jump in and out of different shirim, different classes that interest them, but over 350 communities around the world have committed to learning something today, be it curriculum that we have developed, be it um, you know, whatever it is that your lay leader, your rabbi, your friend, you yourself are interested in teaching. So there's something that's very creative in this form of education. This idea, though, uh, it's actually, I'm corrected, over 402 communities that are involved. It actually makes me very emotional. I love this idea that there are so many people worldwide who have committed to learning, and I love the idea that technology has allowed us to do that, that in fact our very creativity uh, has allowed us to create this kind of um, format for people to learn Torah together. Uh, a side note before we sort of buckle in and get started, if at any point in time you have questions, uh, the beauty and probably the challenge of teaching online is that we can reach so many people, but as a teacher I'm quite lonely right now. I'm talking to a computer screen sort of hoping that people on the other end are catching on to what I'm saying. So if at any point in time you have a question, you can ask that question in two different venues. On Twitter, the hashtag is, um, sorry, my eyes are gonna wander for a minute. It's um, hashtag 24 by 24, 24x24. That'll come straight to our moderator, Karen, and she'll pass that question on. And additionally, on the website itself, on theglobalday.com.org, uh, um, you can go on there, and on the right-hand side, there's a place to ask questions, and that will be coming to me in real time, and I'll try and field those questions as we go along. But the theme today, what we are going to be talking about, is really taking ourselves back to the very, very beginning. And if we want to sort of uncover where we first connected with this idea of creativity, where the ideology of really creation and creativity begin, we, we look no further than Perak Aleph and Sefer Breshit. In the first chapter in the book of Genesis, we are literally being <coughs> given um, a guide on what creativity is, what it means to be creative. And we are going to, together today, explore really the first act of creativity, and that must be the, the act of creation, the creation of the universe. 
Um, I guess what I would say is we wonder often if we are creative people. I find myself very, very drawn to creative people, and it doesn't even matter to me so much what they are creative in. Meaning, you know, I love to cook. I love doing crafty projects with my kids. Let's call that my creative outlet. That's where I go to feel creative. But I certainly appreciate other forms of creativity that I that I don't connect to at all. You know, there are certain sports that interest me not at all. But I find that the creative process that goes into it, or the dedication that goes into it, um, is really quite remarkable. And so I guess the first thing that I would toss out there, either for you to hashtag on Twitter or answer, or just think about for a moment, is how do you yourself define yourself as a creative person? Are you creative? What venues in your life do you consider um, your outlet for creativity? Because I think everyone somewhere within them has this outlet of creativity. Um, and there are things that we pride ourselves on creating, be it something as monumental as another life. If you've given birth to a child, you can certainly attest to what that process is like. Or something as um, simple as a great dinner. So the creative process is something that is woven into our narrative. It's something that we talk about a great deal, yet the, the possibilities are endless. We can reach out in the creative format almost in any direction. Today's direction is going to be in Safe Air Bray Sheets. Uh, either you have the source sheets, you've downloaded them uh, from the site, or you don't have the source sheet. If you have a Tanakh nearby, I'm heading right into um, Bray Sheet, Parak Aleph, the first chapter of the book of Genesis. And there, again, I'm going to use the word creative, with a little creative editing, uh, we've sort of gone through um, the, create, the creation process, and we're going to look at it together. Uh, my apologies if um, my eyes sort of wander to the side right now, because I'm going to do a little bit of reading, and I want to get it right. Uh, the next question that will obviously occur right now is what language we're going to be reading our text in. I'm going to default it into English in the hopes that most people will understand it um, in the English language. If not, the Hebrew is available on the source sheets or in your local Bible. At the beginning of um, Sefer Breshit, we know that uh, Hashem, that God sets out to create the universe. Uh, I'm working off of a JPS translation, uh, and we're going to read in English what it said. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. And God called the firmament heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning a second day. And God said, let the earth put forth grass, herb yielding seed, and fruit bearing tree, and fruit tree bearing fruit after its kind, wherein is the seed thereof upon the earth. And it was so. God very solemnly, majestically, and simply announces what it is that is going to be created each day, and then we watch as those things unfold. We watch as he creates each of those things. So if we look in day one, it's light and darkness. On day two, it seems to be uh, the firmament of heaven. On day three, it seems to be grass and fruit-bearing trees. Um, and God, I'm going to continue on. And God made the two great lights, the great light to rule the day, uh, and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth uh, and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And God saw it was good and there was evening and there was morning a fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let fowl fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. And God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that creeps wherewith the water swarmed, and its kind, and every winged fowl after its kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, a fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth a living creature after its kind, cattle and creeping things, and beast of the earth after its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after its kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground after its kind. And God saw it was good. And then God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. And God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because that in it he rested from all his work which God in creating had made. Forgive me for a long passage. 
Uh, but the sentiment is there. There is a beautiful rhythm throughout the story of creation. It is prose. It is poetry. There is a lovely cadence throughout it, which sort of lulls us and that um, brings us into this story of creation. But if we look into it closely, there is something even um, more significant than um, just the romance of this creation. Uh, there is actually a wonderful symmetry, meaning the way that, that God set out to create the universe seems to be, in a way, a very well thought out plan. What do I mean? If I had a whiteboard, I'd be standing right now, but I don't, and I'm going to sit right here with you, and I'm going to break it down. On days one and two and three, God has created an infrastructure. And on days three, I, I'm sorry, on days four, five, and six, God has filled the earth. So on day one, God has created lights, or day and night, but it is on the fourth day that he creates the sun and the moon and the stars. It is if the first three days God is setting the stage for what he wants to put into earth, and on days four, five, and six, he adds those things to earth, right? On day, on day um, four, he puts in, um, oh, sorry, that was the sun and the moon. On day five, the waters swarm, and now there are living creatures and fowl, right? On day two, there is the firmament, there is the heaven, and there's some water. And then on the, the comparable day, on day five, he's putting in what's necessary to those places. Uh, my sister and I, growing up, <clears throat> we had a dollhouse, and I would spend, we would spend as children, really an inordinate amount of time. I guess this is before cable TV was popular, or my parents held on to that misguided notion of, you know, children, there's no television, we had that for years, but um, we spent a lot of time with our dollhouse, and I really remember very clearly that the fun in the game was really setting it up. Right? I have my infrastructure, I have my house, but then I'm going to spend my time putting everything in its correct place. Where does the oven go and where does the bedroom go and where does this desk go and can we move it here and how does it fit? And really, it's only at a certain point when everything is set correctly in its place that we then move forward and add our little miniature man and miniature woman and miniature children and miniature dog. And actually, that's probably when all hell breaks loose and all the fighting begins. But the reality is, God, in his act of creativity, had a tremendous amount of structure. Day one bumps up against day four, day two to day five, day three to day six. The parallels are created where on the first three days, God lays the groundwork. On the second three days, God puts things in to the infrastructure he has created. It is a beautiful symmetry, <clears throat> and it is a beautiful structure. And of course, God only feels comfortable adding man and woman, creating humankind once everything has been created for humankind. Humanity doesn't begin until everything has been laid. The foundations are laid. Heaven and earth, water, skies, trees, all of that has to happen before, before God feels comfortable adding humanity. So now the real question that needs to be asked is the age-old question, which is, how can creativity exist in a world of structure? If I want to look back at the first act of creativity, if the first thing that I want to look at when I'm discovering what creativity is, is the first creative process, right? It is Hashem creating the universe. Even in that place, even while I am uncovering the creation of the world, the most creative process where you literally have carte blanche to add whatever you want, even in that situation, there is structure and there is symmetry. There's a really beautiful lesson either to be learned or to be pondered here, which is this idea of um, order within creativity, and that's what we're seeing there. But beyond that, when God is finished with his creative process, um, God passes that process and that sense of responsibility on to Adam and Eve. And in fact, in the very first chapter of um, Genesis, in Parak Aleph of Sefer Bereshit, after everything has been, um, has been created, God offers um, Adam the following directive. If you're following on your source sheets, it's the next source. If you're following in your Tanakh, it's um, verses 26 and 27, Psukim, 
Kaf Vav and Kaf Zayin of Parak Aleph, of the first Parak. Um, and God said, my eyes are wandering to my sheet again. I apologize. Um, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. They shall rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, the whole earth, and all the creeping things that creep on earth. And God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What is the point of God waiting till after everything has been created to add people? Why is it that he has waited until this very moment to add humanity? It's an interesting question. It seems that what God has done is really created everything for um, the people and then added them in, brought them into, um, into the story. But what's interesting also is what it is that God gives him, what job God offers to Adam and Eve, what their instructions are. What do they need to do? You are going to rule the fish of the sea. You are going to rule the birds of the sky. You are going to rule the cattle. You are going to rule the whole earth and all the creeping things that creep on earth. God, and in fact the Pasuk tells us, the verse tells us, that God has created man in God's own image. And it seems that the directive, at least in Parak Aleph, at least in the first chapter, the directive that God is giving um, Adam and Eve is you're going to be in charge. You're in charge. You are going to rule over everything that I have created. Seems very interesting. You would think, I mean, certainly from my perspective, you know, when you create something, you feel very connected to that thing. And God isn't micromanaging. What he's saying isn't, I've created all of this, it's mine. What he's saying to Adam and to Eve is, I've created all of this, and now you're going to go and you're going to rule over it. You're going to have some semblance of responsibility, some semblance of even ownership over everything that I have put onto this planet. Now, we can think for a moment of our most pri prized possession and wonder how you care for it and how you protect it. Uh, certainly, in our family, the most prized possession is a kiddush cup. It's a wine goblet that my husband uses every Friday night. And it's um, our prized possession because his grandparents, when they escaped from the Holocaust, that's what came with them, right? This kiddush cup traveled through Germany, through Italy, through into America, until finally it made its way to Israel, where we are, and, um, and that's where it is settled. And we treat it with reverence. We tell our children the story uh, as often as they can handle hearing it. We tell the children, the, our children the story of the Kiddush Cup. We treat it very well. We polish it nicely. We keep it in a very specific place in our break front because that to us is our prized possession. Now, everybody has a prized possession. I you know, challenge you for a moment to think about what it might be. It might not necessarily need to be um, you know, a survive the Holocaust sort of thing. It can be, you know, a trophy that you won in a, in a race when you were in second grade. Everybody has something that resonates with them emotionally. It doesn't need to be, you know, cost the most amount of money. It doesn't need to be the most expensive thing in your house. Really, it needs to be the most meaningful thing in your home. And that's really, we do treat uh, our prized possessions in a very special way. And I think that we, we are not incorrect to assume that Hashem would treat what he has created, this world, also, it's very important to him, it's very sentimental, it's meaningful. This is his creative process, and there's something that's very important to him. Uh, in my jewelry box downstairs, mixed in with, I don't know, the occasional birthday gift, I have um, a little beaded bracelet that I made when I was, I don't know, nine years old. Now, I remember it very, very carefully, because, uh, I remember it very clearly, because I remember beating each bead on very beautifully, very conscientiously, only to when I got up to have the art teacher, who at the time was my mother, um, tie the end of the bracelet, it fell everywhere. And I had to collect up all the pieces, and I had to string each piece again and again and again, until finally it was tied, and I had my little Devora bracelet that I wore around my hand for who knows how long. There's something that's memorable in that for me, and there's something that I that I connect to, right? It was what I created with my own two hands, which had a little backstory. I dropped it, I picked it up, I was frustrated, but it's meaningful to me because I created it. I decided which bead went where, how it was threaded. 
when I wore it, and that became meaningful to me. I think it's similar, although let's put it on a little bit of a different level, uh, to the next source, which is Kohelet Rabbah, uh, Ecclesiastes Rabbah, which comments on the creation of the universe. And this is what it says. It's actually a beautiful, beautiful piece. When God created Adam, God led him all I led him around all the trees in the Garden of Eden. God said to him, See how beautiful and praiseworthy all my works are? Everything I have created has been created for your sake. Think of this and do not corrupt or destroy my world. For if you corrupt it, there will be no one to set it right for you. It's a beautiful idea, right? It's a, it's, um, a very intimate interaction between God and man, where God, in, at least in this piece, God leads man around the Garden of Eden, introducing him to everything that has been created. Look at these trees, look at this garden, look at this river, everything that he has created. It's very reminiscent if you brought your kid to the first day of pre-nursery or nursery, you know, you lead them around. Oh, here is your cubby, here's where you hang your coat, here is where you play the blocks. It's a very, very intimate portrayal of we're giving you ownership over everything. God points out to Adam everything that he has created. What is the underlying message that God is trying to give Adam? I think that it's twofold. On the one hand, God is quite proud of what he has created. He even says to Adam in this Midrash, See how beautiful and praiseworthy all my works are? He knows. He's proud of what he's done. He wants to show Adam everything. So on the one hand, God's saying, look what I've done. Look at my creative process. Look what I have created. But the second part of the message comes with a little bit of a punch. The second part of the message is God saying to Adam, I've created all of this, but now you are responsible for this. Meaning, if you destroy it, if you corrupt it, there is no one to set it right after you. I've made it, but Adam, I'm giving you ownership over it. Now, God is all-powerful, we believe. God certainly could continue along in the creative process. You know, oh, did Adam break that? Oh, quick, let me go in and fix it up. Let me just recreate. Let me do a redo. And what he's saying to Adam is, mm -mm, there's no redo here. I'm giving this to you that I have thoughtfully created, symmetrically created for you. And then I am saying, and now it's about you. And if it doesn't work, and if something breaks, Adam, that's on you. That's what God says. So God's creation is meaningful, and it is important to him. Um, and similarly, I think that we can all sort of think about something that we have created, you know, my bracelet, my nine-year-old bracelet, um, whatever it is that's created that does sit somewhere within you that, that is very, very meaningful. Um, we're going to move it forward, and we're actually going to look at the next source, which is in, the, in Masechet Ta'anit, in the Talmud Bavli. Um, and in this, this brief story, we're taking the idea of Kohelet Rabbah, we're taking this idea of personal responsibility, right? God is giving Adam this sense of responsibility over the Garden of Eden. But we're sort of going to pull that idea, pull that thread, into the story of Choni Hama'agel, um, Choni the circle drawer. Um, Choni is famous for his story of drawing a circle. There was no rain, um, and Choni drew a circle and stood in the circle until rain came down. So he has that name. Yet the story that we are going to tell is a different story about Choni, and it gives us a little bit of a different idea of who he was. And the story goes like this. One day he, Choni, the circle drawer, was journeying on the road, and he saw a man planting a carob tree. He asked him, Choni turned to the man and asked him, How long does it take for this tree to bear fruit? And the man replied, Seventy years. Choni then further asked him, Are you certain that you will live for another seventy years? The man replied, I found grown carob trees in the world, as my forefather planted these for me, so I too plant these for my children. The idea is a powerful idea and a beautiful idea. Why is the old man planting fruit? For the old man it is very simple. I found the earth this way. I am going to leave this earth the same way that I found it. When I was born, there were tr carob trees waiting for me. 
when my grandchildren or great-grandchildren are born, I want to make sure that there are carob trees waiting for them as well. Why is Choni so surprised to see this old man planting a tree? Very often, we live in the here and now. I talk to my kids about it all the time. You know, you're only as popular as your last decision for your kids. You could have done everything for them all day, but the first, no, you're the meanest mother in the world. Very often, we are seduced by instant gratification. What can I have right now, the minute that I want it, as I want it? You know, we see it on television all the time. You know, we are the generation of the channel changers, right? Um, we, don't, um, we don't do beyond that, right? Keep me entertained, feed me, fix me, entertain me at this minute. Um, and that's, that's part of what Tony is expressing here. You know, he looks at an old man planting a tree and he thinks, hmm, what a silly old man. Old man, what, what are you doing? Shouldn't you be home, relaxing, a nice lemonade, it's a hot day out? What are you doing outside planting a tree that we all know isn't going to bear fruit that you are going to benefit from? I am not going to, you know, sugarcoat it. It's not a pretend maybe, perhaps. No. We know for a fact it takes 70 years for a carob tree to, um, to bear its fruit. And Honey, even maybe, you know, politely is trying to say to the man, what are you doing out here? Because the first question that Honey asks the man is, hmm... How long does it take for this tree to bear fruit? He doesn't say, old man, are you kidding me with this? He tries subtly to make his point. How long do you think it's going to take for this tree? 70 years? I don't know. You look kind of old, old guy. So Tony is trying to make his point, perhaps as politely as he possibly can. But in this world of instant gratification, he simply does not understand what an old man is doing planting a tree that he will not get any of the benefit from. And this old man, this unnamed old man, has this great message. This message is, it's about legacy. Number one, everything is bigger than I am. The world that I live in, the life that I choose to lead, it is larger than just about me. It is more than just about me. And that is what this old man is saying. It's for my children. It's for my grandchildren. There's this idea of legacy, of what it is that we leave behind when we go. This same idea of this kiddish cup that has been passed on from grandparent and from father to son to son, hopefully to son, this idea that we pass on something that is meaningful to us, to others, as a reminder, it's not about me. That's Hashem's message to Adam, Right? That's the message that we hear first directly in the Chumash, in the first chapter of Genesis. We see it reinforced in Kohelet Rabbah, and we see that idea carrying on even here, where we are told again and again and again, I'm going to entrust something meaningful to you, the land, the trees, the garden, whatever it is, and I'm going to give you ownership over that. And I'm going to say, the way that you treat the earth matters. The way that you treat my creation matters. And that's really what we're seeing here. Why does the old man plant fruit? It's not about the old man at all. It's about his children. It's about what we leave behind. And every once in a while we need to think, what would we like our legacy to be? What is it that we want carried forth into this world that we have given to this world? And that's something that we consider. Certainly from the start, from Sefer Breshit, we've been getting that lesson. Um, when God creates the world and gives humanity uh, control over it, we need to sort of wonder if God's creation, and we've talked about it, I've mentioned it earlier in the class, if God's creation is so significant to us and so significant to him, why did he not just create a self-sustaining planet? It's a wonderful question and something that I certainly think about a lot. Uh, I am a professed weather nerd. I love following the weather. I like understanding what storms are coming when, what disasters we've managed to sidestep, what disasters, sadly, um, we have been, you know, taken into, we have suffered from. Um, and you've got to wonder, if there's this wonderful planet there, why is it not self-sustaining? Why are there all of these challenges placed in front of us when so easily the challenges could be removed? Um, Adin Evan Israel Steinzelt of um, the Global Day fame, um, he has a beautiful quote. 
He gave a video class on creativity, which, if I am correct, I believe is downloadable um, on our site. And from there, I found one excerpt that I thought really spoke to the ideas that we are talking about today. Um, and this is what he said. Again, my eyes are tilted sideways for a minute. God created the world in order for man to do. We are basically driven and, in a way, obliged to be progressive. Progress is something that we have to do. Not only are we never fighting against God when we are creative, in fact, we are fighting with him. There are silly people, in fact, very intelligent people, who say that if God wanted us to fly, he would have created us with wings. No, he created us without wings, but with the ability to outfly any bird. He created us without all kinds of parts, but we can outrun any animal. We can outdo any fish in the water. This is called the drive to do better. Wonderful. Uh, Rabbi Steinsaltz gives importance to the idea of progress. We are given structure and we are given limitations specifically because God wants to challenge us to find creative and innovative ways to progress in the world. It's not that um, a world without any challenges uh, would be perfect. In fact, a world with no challenges would give us no opportunity to partner with God in creating and developing our world. This is an unbelievable idea. Rav Steinzeltz is putting out there that the reason that we have limitations and the reason that we have structure is really to inspire us to move further, to push harder, to accomplish more. And that really seems to be the lesson that we are learning again and again and again throughout the creative process that God has shown to us. Right? The process that God has shown to us is that there are limitations. Right? There is responsibility. There needs to be this eye on the bigger picture, on this idea that there is something bigger that we can strive to attain. Rav Steinzeltz is criticizing people who live in the limitations, who say, no, if God wanted me to fly, I would have been born with wings. Rav Steinzeltz says, it's so beyond that. The limitations are all put there for us to surpass, for progress to happen. And that's really what we're aiming towards and what we're striving towards, this idea that we look at the limitations that are there and we recognize how we are going to move forward and how we are going to accomplish much more. The invention of the airplane, the submarine, the boat, the car, the train, the pen, the printing press, everything that is on the top list of um, the most um, significant out there have come for to acknowledge some limitation that we have had. I want to get from point A to point B. I have no way to do that. Oh, I am going to now have my creative process be inspired by God, be inspired by the natural world around me, and I am going to work to create more. I am going to work to pr progress more. And that's really what we are looking at. We are looking at this idea of taking creativity, of working hand in hand and being inspired to move uh, to move farther. You know, so often in the terrible world of diseases that we encounter, um, so much of what what develops is a response to something terrible, right? Um, remedies, cures that come to work out things that have happened. Uh, there are so many ways that we are constantly being uh, challenged to progress. It's very easy to sort of sit back and throw the onus onto God. Well. You know, what's created is created. That's where it starts and that's where it finishes. But the reality is that God wants so much more than that. We want so much more than that. We want the ability to create a legacy. We want the ability uh, to progress in the world. And that's the challenge that we're faced. Um, we're going to look at a midrash um, between, it's a discussion between Turnus Rufus and Rabbi Akiva. The evil Turnus Rufus, it says, asked Rabbi Akiva, What is better, the creation of God or that of flesh and blood? Turnus Rufus' question is an age-old question, right? What is going to be better, what God creates or what humanity creates, what humankind creates? Which is the more significant hesseg or the more, most significant um, contribution? Rabbi Akiva says, that of flesh and blood. Without thinking, Rabbi Akiva has the answer. 
what the things that mankind, that humanity creates, those are more significant than what God has created. It sounds a little bit um, heretical, but Rabbi Akiva is confident in his answers. The evil Turner, Turnus Rufus says to him, Rufus assumes that, well, you know, I've won, I've won this conversation. This argument is about to be won by me. And he says, can you make the heavens and the earth? Thinking, checkmate, you guys can't do that. And Rabbi Akiva said, don't give me an example of something that is above mankind, um, that is out of their control, but of things that are common among people. He said to him, why do you circumcise? Why do you have this value of brit milah? Why do you do brit milah? He responded, I knew you were going to ask me that. This is the reason I immediately said that the deeds of man are better than those of man, of God. Bring me wheat and bread. He said to him, these are the creation of God, the wheat, and this is the creation of man, bread. Aren't these better? The evil Turnus Rufus said to him, if God wanted man to be circumcised, then why did he not emerge circumcised from the womb of his mother? How is it possible that we are defiling the way that God intended a baby boy to be born? That is what Turnus Rufus is saying. What if you are criticizing God by giving a child a brit milah, by circumcising that child, you are saying, oh, the baby came out one way, we're just going to tweak it a bit. We're going to fix what it is that God does. Rabbi Akiva counters. Rabbi Akiva says to him, and why does the placenta emerge along with the baby? Should the mother not cut the umbilical cord? Rather, God has provided the commandments for the nation of Israel so that they may improve themselves. As King David says, the word of God is flawless. Rabbi Akiva is very confident in his response to um, Turnus Rufus, right? His response to Turnus Rufus is, God is always allowing us the opportunity, uh, God is always allowing us the opportunity to improve, to progress, and he is actually channeling that here. Uh, I got a nice comment on the side, which is true. Who knew that Turnus Rufus' controversy over Brit Mila, over circumcisions, would re-enter modern politics? It's true. This discussion hasn't been resolved. This idea of baby circumcision, of male circumcision, really is a, a hot topic these days. It is one of these discussion points. But here the commandment is that, uh, that baby boys be circumcised. And here Rabbi Akiva is disagreeing with Rufus. He's disagreeing with this idea of, oh, it was an imperfection. Rather, what he is saying is there is a creative process that God wants us along for the ride. God is constantly invested in this idea of humanity taking ownership, of humanity getting involved and invested. Does that make us partners in, the cre in creation and in the creative process? I need to say yes. I believe that God has created the infrastructure, but God is searching out for partners, and for communication. You know, another example that I would give is in the story of Sodom. When God decides to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, it's his decision alone to make. After all, he's the primordial ruler. He can make the decision of who, who lives and who dies. And, um, but yet, he gets conflicted by it, and he decides that he is going to talk to Abraham about it. And he's going to consult with Abraham a very interesting dynamic that's going on there. God is involving humanity on a decision that is being made by God. And so God turns to Abraham and says to Abraham, listen, there's a lot of evil going on in this city. I got to destroy it. And Abraham immediately kicks into gear, disagreeing with God, challenging God and saying to God, wait, wait, hold up. If I can find 50 great people people who are not sinners in the city. Will you save the city? And God says, yeah, okay. And Avraham continues to barter and continues to banter. It's the creative process at its best. It's an argument with God. It's a discussion with God. What about 45 good people? 40, 35, 30, 25. Avraham gets him down to 5, to 10. If we can find 10 good people in this city, can we save the city? And God says, yes but they weren't there. And God knew that. God knew from the start that the city needed to be destroyed. But what is significant 
this idea of the process. God can create the world and he can create a self-sustaining world. He just created the whole world. It's not hard to, oh, let's keep it sustained. Let's keep, but God wants mankind, wants humanity involved in the process. And that is the lesson that we've seen time and time again. I have created, yet I put it in your court. I have created, yet I have given you responsibility. I have created, yet I invite you to continue along this process. To continue with um, to continue the process and to continue being an involved partner. Creativity doesn't happen easily, right? We need to work hard to be inspired. We need to work hard to really connect to something and create. And what God has done has afforded us the opportunity to reach higher, to think harder, to develop more. Uh, I would say that I don't think it's a coincidence that um, Israel has so many high-tech startups. We really value this idea of the creative process. We really value this idea of ingenuity. And where do we get it from? We get it from the very beginning of time, from the very start, from, the, from creation. Creation gives us this idea, brings us this idea of the importance and the significance of creating together, right? It's not that you're going against God's word that we could be concerned with by developing more. Rav Steinzel tells us it's exactly the opposite. This is exactly what God wants. He wants a partnership. He wants a creativity where we work together to create. Uh, before I hit my conclusion, I want to see if there are any questions out there. I'll give you a minute to type it into Twitter or to type it onto the website. If you have any thoughts, if you want to add any insights or ideas, or if we're just going to...